Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Every single Q&A that I've had since we started this channel a couple years ago, everybody has always asked me about Colt. They say, you know, what happened to Colt? Why is Colt bankrupt? Why are they having these problems? Uh, what does Colt need to do to get themselves back into shape? And, you know, I, I just get these every single time. So what we've decided to do is for me to give you a little bit of a video uh, on my insight to Colt. Now, everything I'm going to tell you here is all my opinion and it's my experience. Now, my experience comes from as being a lifelong historian uh, on Colt, uh, as well as a, as an author who's written uh, on Colt, uh, as well as a former employee who has seen the inside of Colt, uh, to give you sort of an idea of, you know, what got them to where they're at. It, it, it really goes back quite some time, but it really came to head here uh, after the cancellation or the expiration of their sole source contract. But to give you a little bit of my background and how long I've been into this, now, my history with Colt, uh, or interest in history of Colt, pretty much only goes to the Black Rifles. I never was into the cowboy guns. I was, I mean, you know I'm not a 1911 fan. Uh, I do like some of their revolvers. I absolutely love their, the Python uh, and a couple other of their revolvers. Uh, but I've never been much of a 1911 guy. So really, where my insight to the Colt comes in is probably around 1958 or so, once they got the first M16 contracts, or the first, uh, they got the patent for the M16. So uh, I've been doing this my entire life. Uh, Colt has been my absolute uh, dream uh, for my whole life. You know, my biggest goal in life was I wanted to go to work for Colt. That was uh, that was my end goal. I wanted to be able to work with the uh, you know the M16s and M4s. And um, you know, once I started the, my book, is where I first got a relationship with Colt. At that time, there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, primarily uh, was the HKM4 uh, fiasco, where you know the, M the HKM4 was being introduced as a solution to the ailing M4, which was having all these, these problems with malfunctions and so forth. At the time I was writing my book, that was probably the major aspect. And you know, I had gotten involved with a couple of these things because Colt was not responding. You know, if you look at everything that HK was putting out, uh, even the stuff that was false, there was a lot of stuff that was blatantly false about the reliability and durability of the M4. You know, Colt for some reason thought they were going to take the high road and not respond. Uh, which was a big mistake because the majority of people, whether they like it or not, they associate guilt with silence. Uh, they associate that what's, pe what's being told about somebody is true uh, because it's not being fought. One of the earliest memories I can have here of my involvement uh, with Colt, uh, other than uh, visiting Colt on a couple occasions for Black Rifle History development or Black Rifle History research for the book, was there was a re report put out or an article put out. It's HK-416, a better rifle, and you can't have it. And the information that was put in there was just blatantly lies. They were they were they were putting information in there that was untrue. They were comparing a standard HK416 to the M4 the HK propaganda machine, if you want to call it that. You know, it started off with the XM8, which was a better rifle, and you and you can't have it. Um, a lot of the stuff that the HK was saying about the XM8 was blatant lies. Unfortunately, I have to say they were comparing their rifle with their own their own requirements to an M4 that was decked out with SOT mod gear which made it heavier, and also they were making up their own requirements to make their rifle look good when you had the M4 that was meeting with the requirements that the military asked for, but it goes without saying. Well, I had made a rebuttal on behalf of myself, not of Colt, and I had uh, I basically set the record straight, giving all the actual facts of the history, uh, the requirements, and so forth. And Colt pretty much, uh, they, they really liked that. Um, I had gone out there to deliver books, and uh, I had said to General Keys, I said, sir, I want to work for you. I mean, it's been my dream job my entire life. Now, General Keys, I have the utmost respect for. He took over, I believe it was after Whitaker uh, in the mid-90s. Now, General Keys, a former three-star general Marine, and he came in, he was asked to take over, and part of his requirements when he took over, he goes, I have full control. I'm not going to be a puppet. I have full control. And that's exactly what he had. Uh, when General Keys took over as CEO there, you know, he, he ruled uh, with an iron fist. He very much rule and ran the company like it was the Marines uh, because he had so many Marines working for him that he was the only one who made uh, decisions. Nobody else was ever free to make any decisions outside of General Keyes. Uh, General Keyes was truly the hero of Colt just because of the fact that the, you know he was there when this whole M4 thing came around. Now, when the M4 first came out, Colt was in dire financial straits. They uh, just came out of bankruptcy again. They had lost the contract for the uh, M16A2 right after they introduced it to uh, FN. And a lot of that had to do primarily with the cost. Uh, you know, the cost of manufacturing guns in Connecticut is outrageous compared to South Carolina. 
where FN was. You know, you have the automotive union that you had there, which uh, added a lot of money. You have the cost of living in Connecticut versus uh, South Carolina, which was which is astronomical. And you also had the government uh, of the state of Connecticut, who wasn't very conducive with Colt, you know, either. So Colt just had they had loyalty to Connecticut because they've always been there. Not to mention the state of Connecticut has bailed them out. And that has always drug Colt under because of the costs that you know that were required to be there. Well, when the uh, M4 carbine came out around 1995, it was really there just as a general purpose carbine. It wasn't there uh, as a primary type weapon. It was to be bought in, in small quantities. And uh, the reason Colt got the sole source was because there was uh, the government did not protect Colt's data on the M4. The M4 was their weapon. It wasn't part of the 1968 licensing agreement. After this information was released uh, illegally, Colt had a couple options. One, they could have sued the government for money, or two, they could get a sole source on the M4. Well, the sole source on the M4 was, seemed good to them at the time because it was their it was their weapon. They had no idea that once the global war on terror came, that the M4 would become a, a primary weapon. It was luck that it was right at the right time uh, this rifle came out that the global war on terror started and... I don't believe anybody at Colt, uh, when they got that licensing agreement, that uh, that sole source ever would have thought that it would have ended up becoming the next primary weapon of the U.S. Armed Forces. During that time period, there were some decisions that were made that were bad, uh, which hurt Colt. One, General Keyes believed that Colt was always first and foremost a government contractor. I believe that they felt felt that the commercial lines, the pistols, and so forth was all secondary. And that really wasn't where General Keyes' interest was. He wanted to make guns for the military. And during the Global War on Terror, well, as all of you know, the Python was gone. Uh, basically, they shut down all of the uh, pistol lines. They got rid of all their revolvers other than the Model P's for the cowboy guns. And they kept the 1911s. And at that time, also, when General Keyes took over, he had said that as long as he is there, Colt will not make a 9mm pistol. He did not like 9mm, which also prevented Colt from ever being able to win any of the military uh, pistol programs. Because Colt, first off, they always lived in the past. If you look at Colt, probably around the 2000 time period, that was the last time Colt had made any attempt at making a modern combat pistol, you know, the Colt 2000. Of course, it was a flop uh, because of what the lawyers did to the trigger. But uh, that was the last time they made a polymer frame high-capacity 9mm pistol that could have the potential for any kind of law enforcement or military purposes. Once the M4s were in, Colt got pretty complacent. Uh, their engineering pretty much stopped, their R&D stopped, and Colt really became, uh, in my opinion, a mass production company. Uh, they were able to mass produce uh, M4s at astronomical numbers while maintaining absolutely incredible quality. Unfortunately, during all this planning for upcoming events, Colt never got around to planning for what happens when the M4 is done, whether it be by the contract ending or by just a lack of interest. Uh, they never, nothing was beyond that. And during the global war on terror, uh, those years where Colt was making all these guns, they were living high off the horse, literally to say. Uh, they, were, they were building their M4s. Everybody was very complacent. The R&D was down. Around the 2005 period was the time of the SCAR program. And at that point was when you pretty much had the last of Colts, if you want to call them really gun-savvy engineers. After a gentleman named Michael Plant, who was a true gun guy who worked in the engineering department, he, he had passed. Uh, when, he, when he had passed, it was sort of the end of, I think, an era of true gun-savvy engineers at Colt. When I went to work there, which was, it was in April of 2008, when I got to the company, I was sort of shocked. I had realized really this wasn't the company that I I had dreamed of my, working for my whole life. Um, there was a lot of things that were different uh, than I expected. The R and D issue became was a major major problem. Before I got there as, a, as an employee, um, when I came to visit, it was around the time of the, the SCAR program. It just ended. Uh, Colt had, had lost to FN, which was a shame. Uh, because I felt that the SCAR Type C was a much better rifle. The SCAR program uh, was rather negative for Colt in the fact that what Colt had done was they had created two teams to develop rifles for the, the external piston guns. And one was the referred to as the LE-1020, and one was referred to as the M5. So you had two groups that were working against each other. 
come up with that final gun that was going to be Colt's piston gun. I had come there, and at that time, Dennis Veyu, who is now the CEO, he was the head of uh, R&D engineering. Dennis was very good at that, I thought. Uh, he was very open. He did take it. He did take control of it. Um, he did, you know, work through that for as far as the SCAR program and, and, le- and letting some, some development happen with the SCAR program. He had a good team at that point, too, to do it. Hitting the teams against each other was a very bad thing, and it would affect Colt long into the, long after the SCAR program. I had remember going to Colt uh, and sitting in Dennis's office, and he had me look at the 1020, he had me look at the M5, and well, what did I like best? And I told him, you know, I, I, I liked the 1020 most, but there were some features of the M5 that would have been better. Uh, you know, you could have added to it to make a to make a sort of a hybrid between the two. But Dennis was very good in the, in the R&D capability. By the time I got to Colt, he had gone up to be, he had become a, a vice president of the long dishes. I'm not sure what it was. And then Phil Hinckley had taken over uh, the, the R&D area. And Phil was absolutely awesome to work with. The first uh, few months that I was there, I worked with him. My, my position at Colt was uh, I did lots of things. I wasn't one thing. First thing I did was I redid all our manuals because our manuals were very, very antiquated. I had assisted with some of the sales and marketing. Phil had allowed me to work with them in R&D as well because I had a lot of background. Because of my extensive background in history of knowing what Colt did, uh, I was able to let people there who weren't there know things that Colt had done in the past, experimented with. In fact, it really could have saved them money uh, because they'd already done things, but the people that were in charge for the most part had no idea what was already done. Uh, and it cost additional money. One of the major things that I did with uh, Phil Hinckley was when they were working on the 1020 program, they had had all the uh, damage that was happening into the upper receiver behind the camp pen. And I had gotten with Phil and I had said, yeah, I know how to fix this. Um, I had pulled out a report that was done by Winchester in 1968 of a conversion program that they did for the piston gun. And it showed they had seen the same thing with that damaging of the uh, receiver by the camp pen. And they put a hardened steel screw uh, right behind that cam track. So when the you know the bolt would violently come back, the cam pin would strike that steel screw instead of the little receiver. It would stop that. And I gave that to him, and he liked it. He turned it over to uh, engineer Paul Hochstrett. And Paul Hochstrett is also a very, very brilliant engineer. And he turned it into the cam pin guard that they have right now, uh, which they, they have. So you know, he worked on me. I worked on him with that. You know, he had had issues where he needed some stuff, and I, you know, I had a lot of contacts in the industry. It was really nice working with Phil. And then came what we refer, what I refer to as the dark times. Uh, Phil left there. He went over to quality, and a new regime took over in engineering. And uh, I believe that was the beginning of the end uh, for Colt, as far as the engineering program became. Uh, the people that came in, or the heads that came in, were people who I wouldn't say were gun-savvy people. It really split up the way that Colt worked. From that point forward, uh, in my opinion, Colt no longer became a cohesive entity as a company. Uh, Colt was split off into these small little rice bowls where you had people had their little kingdoms, and these little kingdoms didn't did not talk to each other. And engineering was the worst. Um, they would not talk to people. They would not let people know what they were doing. Uh, and also, when you uh, had people who were in sales and marketing. Uh, for instance, law enforcement would go to them and say, this is what the customer wants. They didn't listen to it. Uh, they wanted to give the customer what they wanted. Uh, it was very frustrating because I worked a lot with the sales end, both in law enforcement uh, and in military. Um, I can remember one time where uh, the guy that we had in charge of law enforcement at that time, I think it was Jim Markowski. He was a retired uh, ATF agent. Uh, he did SRT, everything. So he really had his finger on the pulse of law enforcement. And law enforcement was begging for a 10.3-inch barrel. They did not want the 11.5-inch barrel. They wanted a 10.3. And I can remember uh, Jim going to the head of R&D. Uh, this guy wasn't even a real engineer, by the way. He, he'd not gone to any engineering schools. He went to this guy, and he told him, he goes, this is what we want. Now, we, they want a 10.3-inch barrel. And he goes, oh, no, I don't like that. And that was really the attitude at Colt was whether they liked something or not, they didn't want to provide it to the customer. And also, uh, engineering also was very complacent because of the fact that they had all this money coming in from uh, you know, the M4 carbines. And they sat idle. Uh, if you look at the M4 carbine, the attitude was if the government, if the U.S. government was happy with it, leave it alone. Like any company, any company is R&D driven, new product driven. If you don't have a functional R&D department, 
bringing out new products, you don't make money. Uh, the M4 had a reprieve because they were you know, they were delivering so many thousands of these guns a month. Nobody had thought about it, and nobody was in, in the higher ups uh, at Colt. They weren't on engineering to do their job to produce you know new weapon systems. The only new product that, uh, that uh, had come out of of our R and D was prior to this new regime was the one piece upper receiver. Now Colt had not re- released a product to the, the law enforcement or commercial market in rifles since around 1998. Uh, that was the uh, Colt LE 6920, the commercial version or law enforcement version of the M4 carbine. Now they had shown the 1020, which was the external piston gun, and the APC, which is their what we refer to now as the 6940, the DI version of the one piece upper receiver. It wasn't released until 2009. Uh, and I can give a little bit of an impact, a little bit of a thought on that too. At that time, uh, I was there, and my boss, uh, his name was Mike Rising. I had told him that I thought that it was time to release the uh, One Piece Upper because Colt has literally been falling behind everybody else in development of new products. They at one time were the you know the, the master of the M16, M4, and because R and D sat silent and not doing anything, they fell further and further and further behind. There was no new products coming out. Uh, Colt had a very bad name uh, for as far as the media was concerned. Uh, media didn't even deal with them because they weren't sending anything out. And quite frankly, there wasn't really anything to show. We had a new product at the time that was that the Colt the CLG, the Colt uh, Grip Laser. And I thought it would be a good idea to release the two products together, the LE6940 and the CGL. So Mike said, okay, we're going to go and we're going we're to meet with the general. So I sat in the office with General Keys and my boss and said, to them, sir, I think it's time that we, we bring this out. You know, we haven't released anything since uh, 1998 or as far as commercial LE market. Um, you know, I thought that we were behind, and this, this is a good time to release both. And he agreed. He, he agreed. So uh, one of my positions at Colt was to deal with the media. I had chosen several uh, media people who I thought very highly of, uh, such as, you know, Gary Johnston, Dave Fortier, and so forth, a couple other ones, uh, and uh, I got them out, the new LA6940 with the drip laser. And we got our first positive uh, reviews in, I don't know, how many years. I worked very closely with them to make sure everybody had good. In fact, I remember, I think there was like nine or ten of those rifles. And only two of them came back. Um, the people actually bought the guns that we sent them. I also, at the time, was writing for Small Arms Review, Small Arms Defense Journal. And the NRA had had a horrible relationship with Colt since then or prior to that, and I was asked to write an article uh, for them, uh, for NRA, on the U.S. M4, on all the facts about the M4 versus everything was going on. You know, Colt knew I was a writer when I when I went to work for them. I didn't really want to stop. And, in fact, I really couldn't stop uh, when I went to work for Colt because of the finances. Now, um, when, I got, when I got hired at Colt, you know, I, it was, I was paid decently, but there was a problem. I lived in Rochester, New York, and Colt was in Hartford, Connecticut. And I have to say that I knew Colt's history. I knew how they were with people. I knew how they were with staff. I knew they went through employees like crazy. I wasn't really willing to move to Connecticut, move my family to Connecticut, because I didn't know how long the job was going to be there. And it was my dream job. So what I did was I uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to ride this out as long as I can because I, I love working for it. So I commuted from Rochester, New York, to Connecticut for three years. I would leave at 1 o'clock in the morning on Monday morning, get there around 9, 10 o'clock, work four 10-hour days, stay in the hotel that you paid by the hour, and then I would come home on uh, Thursdays. So basically what that meant is the job cost me $300 a week. So out of my salary, it cost me $300 a week or $1,200 a month to pay for gas, to pay for a hotel and food for me to be gone. Plus, I was traveling quite a bit as well. So, you know, the, the job cost me quite a bit of money. So, you know, I, I just knew the way the position was that uh, I, I didn't know how long it was going to last. So the, the writing helped me supplement some of the some of the lost income. Now, some of the top two offices didn't really think a lot of the writing that I was doing. In fact, uh, the one vice president, in his humble opinion, didn't feel that it brought any money in, which is which was totally not true. I was respectful to Colt that any time I would write on Colt products, I would allow them to review it. Now, at that time, I was the only one who was writing for Colt on, on Colt products. I was the only one who was speaking about a lot of their issues and really setting records straight on what was wrong, 
Uh, I wrote about a lot of the older projects that people realized that coal was not, you know, sitting stagnant. There was R&D that was going on. And that goes into problems with management. Now, General Keyes, uh, again, he was a brilliant man, an excellent man. One mistake that I felt that he made was how he hired his executives. Colt had become a retirement home for the Marine Corps. And what that means is everybody who was uh, on any kind of a high-level position at the company was a retired Marine who worked with General Keyes. And the problem with that was that just because somebody makes an excellent general officer you know, in, in the Marines does not mean they know anything about business. So he would put people in very, very high positions uh, because they were retired Marines who were totally incapable and incompetent to perform their job duties. And I guess what I'll give you one example is, is the executive vice president position for manufacturing and engineering. The person he put in charge of that was a Marine whose background was human resources. You put somebody in charge of a department who has no idea about manufacturing, engineering, couldn't even shoot a gun. What does that give you? That gives you somebody who is incompetent, so people that he's supposed to be supervising are now telling him what to do. And a lot of times that information wasn't good or wasn't in the best interest for the company. You had another uh, general uh, who was in charge of uh, a lot of some, some of the, some of the foreign sales stuff who was not a professional salesperson. Again, he was a good general, but he really had no clue what he was doing. And the area where the Marines really did well at Colt was in the manufacturing area for as far as the supervisors back there, but for as far as the business end of it, the ones that he had there, they they did not perform their job duties well. And you know what I can all say about that is the way Colt's structure was there because he brought in all of these Marines was... People referred to each other by ranks in that place. If somebody got a promotion in the company who was a lower rank in the Marines, it became a problem. And the other problem was, was a lot of these Marines, especially the general officers, felt that they could treat uh, the Colt employees who had been there forever and who were civilians like they were their subordinate privates. That really did not go over very well uh, because you can't treat you know people as though you know, you're the general and they're your privates uh, in a corporate environment. It, it doesn't work that way. And with the decisions always coming top down, well, you had people from the top down who didn't have the experience in Colt for 20 plus years to know how to do things, to know how to make the sales to military, to know how to make uh, decisions on R&D, to know how to run people. We had some Marines on the sales and marketing end of it. And the problem with that was these were the kind of Marines who do nothing unless they were given orders. There was no forward thinking. People didn't do anything without being told. You know, thinking back at that structure, the reason why General Keys maybe made it so nobody could make decisions outside of him. Maybe he knew that the people that he put in charge weren't capable of those kind of decisions, and he didn't trust that they were able to do that. Therefore, everything had to go through him. And, you know, the problem with that is, is you don't have anybody who can make decisions. You know, if uh, you're, you're looking at doing an advertisement campaign, you can't just do it. Uh, you know, guns couldn't even lead to go to, to writers without having the general's approval. There was just no autonomy. Uh, everything had to come down. And the other thing about General Keyes was um, he lived in Virginia, I believe, and he was not always in the office. Um, he would fly every week from Virginia to Connecticut, and then when he would come there, he would just be bombarded with things. And another thing that General Keyes was forced to do, he spent a lot of time in New York City dealing with the, uh, the board, trying to keep the board happy. Uh, a lot of the day-to-day -day operations that were problematic, he never knew about. And they made sure that he was, in, you know, he was unaccessible by mo most of the people in the coal plant. Another interesting aspect that I had learned was uh, when you go to the coal facility in Connecticut, in East Hartford or West Hartford there, there's two buildings. You have the front building, which is all the administrative, HR, engineering, sales, marketing, uh, IT, and so forth. And then outside is the actual factory. Now, there's a big difference between going into the office building in factory. When you would go into the factory, that was the cult that I knew and loved. That was where you had the people who were dedicated to the tradition, to the quality, to, I think, what all of us uh, always thought of cult. You had employees that had been there for generations. Um, you would have these old ladies who were on assembly for the M4, and you would not believe how fast they could put these things together. You had a lot of really, really dedicated, you know, polishers, you had the metrology department. You had all those things that just made Colt what it was. When you walked into the, you know, to the main offices there, the people there were again mostly retired Marines. Uh, 
There were people in the, the R&D departments who I don't believe had the same goals uh, that uh, some did. A lot of those people were waiting to uh, supplement their income until their retirement checks came through and then, then leave. The R&D department, I, I think probably as time went on, became more and more of an issue. The lack of having new programs coming out, the further and further Colt got behind. And I think there's a lot of morale issues that happened within the company as well, because a lot of power was given to people who used it for things that were not so much in the company's interest as they were their own. The gentleman who was in charge of engineering was responsible for destroying a lot of people's careers. You know, he got a lot of people fired. If he didn't like somebody, he did what he had to to get him fired. And we lost some really, really incredible people. I was part of that as well. General Keys was there. General Keys liked me. He hired me. Uh, he saw they saw I was doing good work. Uh, I always had good performance reviews. The day that General Keys retired and left Colt Defense and went to work for Colt's Manufacturing was the day that I was let go and a lot of other people. It was funny because I came to find out later on the reason why I was let go was I had released an article. Uh, now, the same information was in my book. I did an article on Lewis Machine and Tool. And uh, as well as in my book, you guys heard me talk about the LMT Enhanced Bolt Carrier Group. And it was developed at the, at the request of SOCOM uh, to, uh, to take care of some of what we referred, they referred to as uh, issues with or uh, deficiencies with the M4 carbine. At the time that came out was when Colt was having all kinds of QC problems with bolts breaking, uh, with uh, extraction issues. You know, um, they went right to Carl Lewis and said, we need a better bolt. We need something that has better extraction. We need something that has a, a stronger bolt so it doesn't break and so forth. Well, the article came out where I was re doing a review on the Lewis machine tool, and I put the words in there, the same ones that were in my in book, Black Rifle 2, that the SOCOM had asked them to create a bolt that would correct efficiencies. So basically, uh, this engineer used that as, you know, he's against the company, and he was able to, to get me gone. At that time, I was uh, traveling probably damn near 70% of the time. I was gone for uh, weeks on end all over the world uh, with, with marketing and sales, doing everything from demos to armor schools and so forth. Uh, I was the one who did all, all the manuals. I had a lot of accomplishments while I was at Colt, um, but uh, this gentleman seemed to, he wanted me gone. Uh, we had had other issues uh, that were in the best interest for the company, but not best for him. To give you an idea, a couple of the things that I had done at Colt, which probably sort of got me in trouble, uh, but they were the right things. Uh, first off, we had uh, a couple hundred 9 millimeter SMGs that were ready to go to the Mexican DEA. And I happened to go back there. And I saw that the ejectors were not tuned. The ejectors have to be tuned inward against the side of the bolt carrier. So when the bolt comes back, it strikes the cartridge case. The way these drop in, uh, the ejectors are straight. And if it comes back, you can actually miss the cartridge case. And when you miss the cartridge case, the bolt can come back. And it doesn't eject, so it will drop into the trigger compartment. It'll lock up you know, the mechanism. So I went back there and I went to the, to the manufacturer. But I said, "Hey guys, we you know this wasn't done. They brought somebody in overnight to get that fixed. You know, we caught it and everything. Well, came in the next day and I was uh, basically getting yelled at because what were you doing back there checking this stuff? It's not your job to go back and check this stuff. I was very good at, at finding problems, uh, you know, and finding issues. So rather than us all being on the same page, hey, we got this. Thank God. It was what were you doing back there? Somebody was, somebody was worried about getting in trouble." You know, and going along with that 9mm program, another thing that I had done was uh, I had been in Jamaica, and I had been uh, in, I forget where else we were at, uh, India, uh, and we had had 9mm SMG trials in both in demos. And I had had, on both occasions, I had had major malfunctions with the 9mm submachine guns because of failure to eject. And one was a failure of the, of the barrel. The barrel nut came loose in India, which is very embarrassing for me, uh, trying to explain that this is not how these products normally are. Uh, and then we had the issue with the cartridge case getting caught in the compartment because of the failure to eject. I had come back, and uh, I had to design a new buffer to eliminate both uh, the failure to eject and the uh, failure due to the cartridge case from getting lodged in the trigger compartment, which was basically an extended top uh, par portion of the buffer on the 9mm submachine gun. I gave it to our executive vice president and said, you need to, this, this will solve all these problems. Engineering took it back there. Well... Because it was my idea, it wasn't going to happen. So instead of uh, fixing the one part of the of the buffer and moving it forward, the engineering department decided they were going to make a separate plug and put it in the back. So here you go. It wasn't developed by me, so we're not going to listen to you. 
And another major thing uh, that had come through, which really pissed me off, was uh, I worked a lot with military guys, uh, you know, throughout my time at Colton. Actually, throughout my life, a lot of stuff with the military. Actually, I worked more with the military when I got out than I did while I was in. And I got a phone call from a good buddy of mine at Fort Drum saying that, hey, man, we just got a whole bunch of these new uh, 10 follower Gen 3 magazines, and they are jamming like crazy in both our M4s and our M16A4s. At that time, at Colt, we were using Green Follower magazines to, to, to send into the U.S. government. Colt generally is a rule, regardless of what the U.S. government does, they're not going to put something new into their, into their system if they don't test it and they don't approve of it. So I said, send me, send me four or five magazines. So he sent them to me. I turned them over to engineering. They went back and they had problems. They said, we need more of them. So I got authorization to basically say, hey, uh, I'll give you, for every one case of these Tanfall magazines, we'll give you two cases of PMAX. Next thing I know, we had like three cases of these magazines show up. So engineer takes them back there, and they do a, a major test, and they find problems. So when I went back to inquire, they wouldn't give me any information. I wasn't, I, I wasn't engineering. I wasn't, uh, you know, capable. I was too much of a risk to have someone else have engineering know about engineering uh, information. So uh, they contacted Picatinny. And Picatinny brought people out to Colt. And right before they got there, my boss, Mike, took me into his office and said, he goes, look, I was told by the, the engineering guys that you can't, they don't want you near the, the guys from Picatinny. Because obviously they wanted to be the heroes and say, oh, we found this problem and everything. And my boss says, but I do want you to know that by finding this problem, you probably saved lives. Which is probably the nicest thing my boss ever said to me. And you know, he knew that it was wrong me being kept out of the loop. I was, you know, I was good enough to bring them all the information and the problem, but I wasn't good enough to be involved with it. I did end up eventually, eventually going to the the second in command of uh, Colt, the guy under, under General Keys, and said, this is bullshit. I brought you this information. Uh, you know, I arranged everything. This is ridiculous. I can't have access to the information of what's going on. Well, the information that I gave them and it was eventually given to Picatinny stopped the production of that magazine. They got it fixed. So no more went out to the troops that were bad. So what I mean by rice bowls, you would think that we were all supposed to be on the same team, and we never were. Uh, it was always uh, it was always separate. What brought Colt to the position that they were in was a combination of, first off, the attitude that we were only a government contractor. That was our primary end. Regardless of whether you are a primary government contractor or not, Colt, uh, as it was enveloped, it was law enforcement, it was commercial guns, it was everything. The changing of the attitude that it was only for, for military production and not keeping those other ends really going was a detriment that would come back to bite them because everything comes to an end. And if you don't plan for it, you, know, you will have the devastating uh, you know, circumstances. You know, you know, buy it. You know, we go back to that time. You look at the, the 90s when Colt, it was really, I think, more used to kiss the government's ass because they just lost the contract. Oh, we're going we're gonna to come up with the Colt Sporter series, and we're going to put the auto sear block in it, and we're going to make it that much more difficult for you to convert to full auto. We're going to hack off the bayonet lug. That really upset people. And prior to that, uh, Colt had voluntarily uh, pulled their AR-15s from the civilian market. They just put them up you know, directly. Only available to law enforcement and military, which got Colt the attitude from their customers that you don't care about us. All you care about is your government contracts. Colt lost people at that point. They lost a lot of people say that you don't care about us, we don't care about you. And any successful company knows that, you know, you need to have all those sales because it, anytime any one of them, you know, falls off, that's where your safety line is. That's where your money is for your safety line. And then we get into the uh, the band period, post-94. Colt introduced their their match target series, which was the band compliant, which was great. I mean, that was uh, all anybody could have. Then we had the, the sunset of the assault weapon band. Well, here's another major cult screw up. They left all of their match targets the exact same way. And what ended up happening, which is sort of interesting, was the LE guns became legal. LE, LE 6920s. Now, LE means LE, law enforcement model. So, Colt had three different types of production lines law enforcement, military, and commercial. Uh, the LE only went through LE, LE distributors, and according to the board, that was only to go to law enforcement. Well, those guns were funneling from LE distributors into gun shops and commercial hands. So when the sunset of the assault weapon man, the top selling gun was the LE 6920, and that was an LE gun, not a commercial gun. Colt never, up until more recently, replaced the match target uh, post ban with the new sunset, you know, non-regulated ones. 
So the commercial market was all buying LE guns. They never upgraded their commercial guns, which really pissed off a lot of people unless you were living in New York or one of these band states. So there was another impression, you know, Colt doesn't care about the commercial or sales or anything. And also at the time of the uh, of the global war on terror, Colt wasn't even meeting their government co- or their LE contracts. Colt literally, you, you, if you wanted an LE 6920 in the police department, good good luck on getting it. They didn't uh, allot uh, that production time to uh, the LE production, which comes into the Colt Canada. It comes into the buying of Dimaco. You know, Colt had bought Dimaco uh, for many reasons. First off, Dimaco had a first-rate engineering department. Um, their capabilities far exceeded what they had in, at, at Hartford at that time. Uh, these guys were active R&D. Uh, they didn't have to wait to have anything to be told to. They were constantly upgrading their rifles. Um, they were smart enough in, in Canada to realize that, you know, the U.S. government gun is not the is not the final resting place here of the design. That customers eventually were going to get a lot smarter and say, we know there's better guns out there. We know guns that have enhancements over the Colt M4. So they continued to update the gun and make better models. The Maco also also had worked with Colt in the past when Colt would have issues with. Uh, you know, with, with their strikes and so forth by the unions and whatnot, they didn't have the ability to move forward on a lot of their projects. For instance, the LMG project. Uh, Hank Tatro worked at it. They had a, a strike at the time. They turned that project over to Dimaco, and Dimaco took it, and, and they were ones that came out with the LMG. There was a lot of, of programs that Colt Canada had worked on, or Dimaco at the time. And the second was they had felt that uh, they could use Dimaco to uh, supplement their lack of ability to procure guns for the law enforcement market. Now, Colt had used Dimaco components, you know, as spare parts and as parts for their for their military contracts, such as just the, you know, stripped upper receivers, bolts, bolt carriers, and so forth. They wanted full rifles to go to law enforcement. Well, their legal department didn't do a very good job of researching that. After the acquisition was done, they found out that uh, due to the fact uh, of the importation ban that was put in place, they could not import these guns into the U.S., now, for law enforcement, law enforcement could, but they had to be drop shipped right to the police departments. So they couldn't get these into their LE distributors, which is where a lot of the, what a lot of their the sales wasn't going towards LE agencies. It was going towards the commercial market. They knew that, uh, but they, you know, it was probably easier not, not to let the uh, the people in in New York know that, you know, that these were guys were going to commercial, not law enforcement lines. So there was a couple batches that were brought into the United States. They were uh, basically Colt Canada rifles. Uh, with U.S. stocks, U.S. Uh, fire control groups, and uh, with some U.S. markings on them. They became very valuable to collectors, but uh, it was too, it was so much of a difficult thing to do, they, they couldn't. And I, ha- I had a big fear that when uh, Colt acquired Dimaco, that they were going to destroy Dimaco, because Dimaco was a incredibly well-run, well-oiled machine, did very well with, with, their, can- with their Canada contracts, as well as their all their LE military contracts. In fact, it was Canada who got the British contract for the SAS for the L one one nine A one, which Colt could not get because they had been in within bankruptcy within ten years, and uh, the UK won't do business with a company like that. Which is better off anyways because Colt would have shoved the M four in their face and said, "This is good enough for you. This government is good enough for you." Where the rifle that was needed by the SAS was one that uh, had to have extended range. They had there was things needed to be done to it to make make it fit their requirements. Which Colt Canada. Or Demaco was well in uh, capability of doing, but so the failures beginning there with the uh, lack of civilian and law enforcement sales. There's one of your first major ones, uh, bringing in people who knew nothing about sales and marketing, uh, but were just there because they were retired Marines. You brought people in who did not know what they were doing for as far as uh, the sales, marketing, and development. You had an engineering department that was brought in with people who were virtually lazy. You know, they, they did not do anything to enhance the gun. You would think that they would be trying to take the M4 carbine and make it better because there are there are customers out there, as I said, they want better guns. They know that other companies are making superior guns, better bolts, better bolt materials, better barrel, bar, better uh, barrel processes, and so forth. And rather than, than do that for their other customers other than the U.S. government, they just kept stagnant. They fought uh, releasing uh, new products, uh, it, you know, the, if you look at the one piece upper receiver, they had that since 2005 with the release of the uh, scar guns that sat there. It sat, you know, you saw it at shows, but it wasn't actually released until 2009. You look at the external piston gun, which was a complete cluster around the 2004 time period with the release of the HKM4. 
they got people on the bandwagon who wanted external piston rifles. And, of course, now you have HK, you have LWRC, you have POF. Um, you have companies who are now making external piston versions of the rifle, which Colt had. Well, in Colt's infinite wisdom, they thought that if they were to release an external piston rifle, that they would, they would be admitting that there was something better than their M4, which was a complete, utterly wrong way to look at it. The way that you look at it is, okay, we have customers who want this, we're going to give it to them. They didn't do that. So they spent all this time trying to tell you how much better their, you know, their internal uh, rifle was, internal piston rifle was compared to an external. So, meanwhile, HK got a lot of sales, uh, LWRC got sales, and POF got sales, and Colt did it because they thought they were gonna, it was gonna affect them, and that, that was wrong. The LE-1020 went on to become the, uh, the Colt piston carbine, uh, LE-6940P. Colt manufactured very few of them. Uh, they became collector's items, and now, they're no longer in the catalog. Colt is now only making them for the uh, military market. Major problem. Uh, then when you would have other decisions of products that could have sold, um, I can remember going into Dennis Vayu's office because at the time that I went to, I worked at Colt, he was the president of Colt's manufacturing and the commercial out of it. You know, I said, well, we, need to re- we need to release as a U.S. government copy of the M4 to the commercial market where it comes the exact same way our military ones do with a 16-inch barrel. You know, you can put the proper U.S. government marks on them and everything. They never did it. What are they doing now? Now you're seeing LE 6920s or 6921s with pinned on longer barrels that say property of U.S. government, and they come with a rasp like something that I had mentioned to them back then. And it also, it seemed, where it comes to making smart business decisions, what would Colt do? He did the exact opposite. Colt has had some opportunities to release guns to the commercial and LE markets that would have been incredible, would have made them tons of money. A good example would be their CK-901, their 7.62x39. That gun would have done awesome in the commercial market. They showed it at trade shows, never produced it. Then we come up to the time of the individual carbine. Uh, you know, Colt put a rifle on the individual carbine. Ambidextrous lower receiver, very, very, very nice, impressive rifle. Did they release it to the commercial sales? No, that gun would have done incredible. So there's two opportunities that they had. They could have brought guns to the market that would have made them money. They didn't do it. Now comes the next bankruptcy. Well, it was obvious why it happened. They weren't providing the guns to the commercial market. Um, they had lost all innovation. There was no new products. And uh, the company had not released parts. Sales to International were dropping because, again, they had competitors out there who were making guns just as good, if not better. And foolishly enough, banks gave Colt a bailout, and they allowed the same people who brought it down into bankruptcy to run it again. And where are we at now? Still, no new products, still not much improvements in international sales, threats still there of them going under once and for all. And unfortunately, if they if they go under this time, it's done because everything they had was up for collateral. The bad decisions just kept on and on and on. What do I think it would take for Colt to come back out of this? It doesn't take rocket science. You can get a new R&D department, somebody who actually uh, is dedicated to new, new product development. It was absolutely pathetic, and I mean pathetic, that Colt, for the first time in their history, did not submit to a pistol replacement program to the U.S. military. Colt had had, every, had, had pistols in every pistol competition we've ever had, but the XM-17. That, that's unacceptable. And, you know, another aspect with engineering was with the individual who took over. He fired everybody who knew what they were doing. We had excellent engineers. You know, Greg Rosen, there was was a lot of incredible engineers for pistol development. When Colt fired people, they always fired the wrong people. The people who were responsible for putting the company there, they stayed. The ones who knew how to do things are gone. Y'all wonder why there's no Colt Python, why it never came back. There's nobody left who can do that at Colt. Um, That All that custom hand... Handwork. Those, in fact, the last guy I knew who was there retired. His name was Little John. He was, when I was there in 2008, that time period, he was the last one left who was ever on those lines. And his primary job was, was uh, custom fitting some of the parts on the cowboy guns, the P models. They don't have that. It's all CNC now. All that custom, the custom working is gone. You know, they don't have, they don't have that anymore. They need to have a new engineering department, somebody who knows what he's doing, somebody who brings in people that know uh, what's going on. The people they brought in, I mean, you look at the M240 and 249 contract the Colt had and failed, the, the failed barrels. This was primarily because, 
engineering got rid of the people who knew how to do this kind of stuff. You know, the, the, the head guy there brought in his buddies uh, who worked for companies who didn't even make all-loading firearms. So you, you have people on top who don't know what they're doing, leading people who don't know what they're doing. Of course, you're not going to get your M240s to work. They had, they had a warehouse full of those machine guns that they couldn't sell to the U.S. government because the parts weren't interchangeable. You know, it's not uncommon for, uh, you know, a competitor who ends up getting a uh, contract for a, a government gun. They get a technical data package. And not necessarily all the information is in there uh, because they don't want to give out all of their trade secrets. Well, if you have a competent engineering department, they can figure that out. We didn't, Colt didn't have a competent engineering department at the time to be able to do that. So, the, you know, first and foremost, to get this company run, you've got to get people out on the top. And you got to bring people in. One who's going to care about the... The company is traditions and want to keep it going uh, and get the company back to their roots and deliver new products. You know, every time you see any advertisement from Colt, anything, it's bringing back, it's bringing back, it's bringing back this 1911, bringing back that 1911. You know, they're, they're, they're living in 1911. Um, there is only a certain amount of the market who cares about 1911s. New law enforcement, new military contracts want modern military combat pistols. Colt could not provide those. They stay with, with making cowboy guns, you know, all going back to that tradition back there. There's only so many people who want cowboy guns. You know, Colt still would charge a premium on those 1911s when most of the companies out there who are making 1911s now make a better 1911. They're more hand-fit. They're more custom parts. They're not stock pistols like, like what you're getting from Colt. Uh, an aggressive marketing department, an aggressive marketing department that will work with the media because regardless of uh, whether you believe it or not, you need media. You know, I had had a, a meeting with uh, my boss and one of the vice presidents who was telling me how, uh, you know, I was moonlighting on my own for as far as doing the, the writing and that they, that, you know, didn't bring him any in. And they, I was putting people out by asking them to get me products that I could review when my writing, I was the only one who was doing it at the time. And it was bringing notoriety to Colt. It was bringing explanations that people were able to realize that maybe Colt's not dead. You know, bringing back some of their old programs. Colt has to get out of Connecticut. There's no way they're going to make anything in a competitive price with the cost of the union up there, the cost of living up there, and the taxes. And they're also, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a gun-friendly state. Um, you look at a lot of people, you know, they wouldn't take a job in a state like myself. I wouldn't take a job in a, in a state like that where, you know, guns were illegal and everything was, I couldn't even own what I was making. You have to get out of there. But more importantly, you have to have it run by somebody who is dedicated to bringing this company back to its greatness. Uh, bringing it back to it being a major industry leader uh, in firearms, uh, R&D, development. If you look at the Colt, the Colt in the 1980s, you know, that would have been the time to work at Colt. Uh, you know, that's when you had just engineers that were at the top in the world, you know, Mac McCall and Hank, you know, Hank Waterman, you know, and Kevin Kaminsky there. You, you just literally had, you know, Ken Maynard. And you had all these, Jim Taylor, another one. You had all these engineers who were just brilliant guys who were pumping out new products every freaking year, new ones that were developed for different purposes and, and, and all that. That really would have been the time. You know, there were so many failures that were done because of, of, of lack of R&D. The cold offensive handgun weapon system was another one, you know, uh, for the Mark 23 program. You know, looking with Colt through into that against the HK uh, pistol 1911 with a rotating barrel. That the rotating barrel they couldn't get to work in the Colt 2000 that failed. It, the gun never had a chance. You know the guns were breaking. The SSP, I believe it was called, the one that came out uh, for the XM9 program. That was also at the time where Colt was their R&D was starting was starting to lag. But up until the 2009 time period, that's really when the R&D just failed. And I and I believe R&D was a major a reason for this failure and the continuing failure. You know, the, you know, the, the current president, Dennis Veyu, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for him. You know, he had done a lot of the position, another position he had at Colt was awesome. You know, uh, definitely in his defense, when he took over, Dennis was left with a shitstorm. I, you know, most of the damage had already been done. I think one of the biggest problems that Dennis had was he was unable to fire the proper people because they were his buddies. He was unable to get proper engineering people in there, and he allowed people to run rampant. You know, when you when you allow certain people to run rampant, to go around firing people at will and and so forth, and you have people who are allowed to, instead of making your company a cohesive unit working together all for the same goal, to separate departments that don't talk to each other and they don't work together. Unfortunately, you can only go after the head of the company for allowing his company to, 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 to be in that position. Do I believe Colt has a future? The only way they're going to have a future is if they have a change in management and people who care about what's going on. 
and people who are dedicated to the company, not to themselves. You know, it was great that General Keyes helped out a lot of Marines when they came out, but unfortunately, the Marines that he hired in his front offices, they were not people up to par with the task of the business ends. You know, there, there was no business, no sales, no marketing. They had no experience in it whatsoever. And bringing somebody into a sales meeting just because he had stars on his shoulders uh, does not bring any more credibility than bringing somebody in who actually knows about what the guns are. Officers who weren't even in combat arms who didn't even really use the M4s. The major issue with him hiring the Marines only applied to the front office. We had a lot of Marines that were in our manufacturing areas who were awesome by you know, you know, run, you know running production lines and all that kind of stuff. They, they really worked great there because it was a technical job. But bringing somebody into a, a, a multi-million dollar company to work with sales and manufacturing engineering and having people who were not qualified for those jobs, that was a disaster you know, waiting to happen. And, you know, thinking back, why General Keyes ruled it with an iron hand, why he made all the decisions, maybe he knew that. Maybe he knew that those people that he were bringing in were ones who were not going to be uh, the guys out innovating and thinking for themselves that they, they were going to have to be told what to do. Um, or or they, they, were, they didn't have the knowledge that was there to make a lot of these decisions. Well, I just wanted to make sure you guys understand that I'm not saying you don't hire the veterans. But what I'm saying is, is when you have, you know, major corporations with these particular uh, kinds of uh, products, you have to have people who know how to sell, how to deal with these foreign governments, uh, how to conduct weapons demonstrations, weapons programs, and how to how to market. You know that you, you don't get that coming out of the military. Um, there's nothing in you know in sales and marketing in the military that, that that gives you the knowledge to be able to do as such. The corporate culture bringing you know a large number of military people into the civilians is a difficult thing, especially, as I said before, when you have general officers who like to treat everybody as they're their underlings, you're yelling at them, screaming with them. It got bad enough at Colt that uh, one of the executives had a restraining order against him uh, by another one of the executives because of the way that he treated him and yelled at him and it made the guy feel uncomfortable. So when you get to that kind of a position, you really have to relook at how you're doing things. You know, I'm former Army. Uh, I was there. I got treated by a couple of these Marines uh, as I was an underling uh, rather than uh, somebody who was there as a professional who knew what they were doing. You know, um, if you look at a lot of the sales and marketing, uh, you go to a trade show where you be, you know, you need to have somebody who could talk technically about weapons. They'd bring a, you know, the, you know, a good looking buff Marine to one of these things, but they wouldn't, that good looking you know, buff Marine, every time he was asked a question, would always say, well, that's a good question. He wouldn't be able to answer it. You know, um, it was this idea where you have to have a military to sell the military, or in that case, Marines to sell the Marine to the Marine Corps. When, yeah, it's great these people were Marines, but they don't know about the guns. They can't answer the questions. They don't understand what they're being asked. It was that whole attitude of the faces that they wanted to the company. Unfortunately, those faces didn't go along with the business. They didn't go along with the, the proper way to market, sale, develop, any of that stuff. Uh, that's why you have industry professionals who, who do this. And that was one of the things that Colt really never did was they, uh, when General Keyes came in, they really didn't hire what you would call industry professionals. It was all people who came out of the Marine Corps. Um, you know, if you look at some company like, you know, SIG, or for instance, who uh, they need a marketing head, they're going to go after and they're going to find somebody who has marketing experience to go and do it. If you look at somebody who's in charge of law enforcement sales, you're going to bring in somebody who understands law enforcement sales, bring in somebody who can actually talk to these people and, and understand what's going on, somebody who has experience with law enforcement sales. You're not going to bring in somebody who just has never worked in a sales job in their life. They come right out of an infantry unit in the Marine Corps. Now you're putting them in charge of selling guns to uh, law enforcement. It, it, was a, it was not hiring people who are qualified uh, to do their jobs. When you, when, you, when you sort of have the whole picture and you see what it was like on the inside, and you also know the history you can really clearly understand where things went wrong and uh, why it still continues. Now, to this day, to my understanding, there's, there are a lot of newer people that were in there because, again, they, they, you know, for one reason or another, a lot of people were fired. But it still is true today. You know, you go to the, the SHOT Show this year was very, very sad to see a Colt had a little tiny booth that was, uh, you know, sitting on the back of uh, LWRC, you know, with only a few guns to show. You know, to, to literally be to, to be taken down to that from literally an empire that you used to have. And there's no reason for it. I mean, uh, the stuff that I'm telling you that they need to do with this stuff is not rocket science. 
new products, professional sales, um, your staff, you can't have a high turnover. Another problem this industry has as a whole is high turnover. Uh, people don't stay in the same positions. They move from company to company to company, which is a bad idea, you know, um, especially in the sales end of it. You know, a lot of your customers, it takes time to build relationships and to build trust. And it's very difficult to do that when you firing people left and right, and they're always dealing with new people. And Colt has been a complete revolving door, whether people are fired for just cause or just because somebody in engineering doesn't like them. You know, I really hope this company does uh, come back. I'm not a disgruntled ex-employee. I am somebody who is very, very disappointed in the way things uh, turned out. Um, I dedicated I dedicated myself 100% to Colt. My wife raised our, my children from that at that point as a single mother because I was traveling all the time. Colt was just very impervious to any kind of change, to any kind of anybody coming in who had energy or who wanted to do anything. Um, they squashed that you know, relatively quickly. You you saw very quickly the complacency uh, in the government contracts. That all that money was coming in. Everybody was really happy. Um, I'm just sort of glad I wasn't there at the point where they lost the government contracts because it would have been horrible to have to see all those people being let go. I mean, hell, it was bad enough when I was there. Uh, we had uh, three shifts going. 24 hours, and uh, they cut down to uh, one shift, and they had a furlough uh, one day a week where they, they weren't going on. And then to find out that they're down to a skeleton crew, you know, that to keep that company open, there's a good number of guns that have to be made per day. And if you don't have military contracts, there's no jobs. You know, I, I really hope that uh, if Colt does go under this time again, that the name is bought by somebody who wants to bring the company back, wants to restore it to its greatness, uh, who will get back into, you know, some of the classics, but uh, they'll be more so concerned with uh, having new pistols that are available to our government and to our law enforcement and for export, to taking a rifle from 1995 and developing new weapons platforms that are better, that are stronger, more durable, more reliable, and will last longer. Um, with better finishes, better you know, barrel materials, and so forth. And also maybe to build a whole new platform that's not built off of the AR-15 M16. Um, that's what I believe is needed. Now, again, these are all my thoughts, my uh, experiences as a historian who's dedicated his life to the Colt Weapons platform, its history, and then to uh, you know working for them. As you see still to this day, I do reviews on Colt Weapons. If the weapon is good, I tell you. If the weapon is bad, I tell you. The Colt Expanse video that you saw, that, that was horrible. That was terribly pathetic. That was a mistake. But then you had the Colt Combat Unit. They did a very good job on that. The individual carbine, their entry, they did a beautiful job on that. Why don't you sell it to masses? It was an external piston, piston-operated rifle. To have that beautiful lower receiver that they had on that individual carbine and to not sell it is a crime. These are all things that could make them really good money. Colt's been showing a commercial semi Mac only uh, ambient or receiver for the last few years. There's nothing there. They haven't, they haven't released it. LA-6940, the one-piece uppers, that was sort of a disaster for Colt. Uh, it was a disaster because, you know, their uh, lawyers were sleeping at the helm. They violated Carl Lewis's patent. Now, I know I know Art Dago. I know Michael Plant. I know the guys who developed it at Colt. Do I believe that they took his design and copied it? No. They had the ideas for one-piece upper receivers as well. But... You can't uh, design something and not patent it and not have a patent search because people do have the same ideas. Colt has to pay a royalty to Lewis Machine until so is Dimaco or Colt Cannon up there with their IUR. Violation of Carl Lewis's patents. You know, lawyers, are not, if they're not doing their jobs, you spend a lot of money in R&D on something that you're going to have to pay somebody else for. you got to have people who are on the ball, you know, with this stuff. Colt had a really good lawyer uh, that uh, he ended up getting, getting let go. Which was, which was which was a terrible injustice because this guy this guy was awesome, but again you have there's a mold you have to fit there that uh, if you don't fit it you know you're, you're gone. The Colt has had at points they had the Colt had the best weapons designers in the world working for them. They were a mecca for uh, new R and D in modern military weapons uh, to come to the point now where they're they're literally on the on, on the ass of the dog's tail. They are so far behind uh, other AR manufacturers that. The military doesn't even really consider them viable anymore. It's good to see that they got a contract. It's good to see that they're making weapons for foreign military sales. I'm glad the government threw them a bone. It's not going to help if they don't correct their, their problems. I hope you guys found this interesting. This is an inside view uh, of, of what I saw and why I think Colt is where they're at. 
And I wish them the best. I want to see them succeed. Uh, there's no, there's been no cult flagger more so than me. I remember my boss saying, uh, when one of the people retired that they had, you know, the blue cult blood. Well, there's a lot of people that really had blue cult blood that were let go for no good reasons. Um, people who were dedicated, people who, who want the company to succeed. You need those people back. You need the ones who are going to help push you forward and not drag you behind with them, which a lot of people that you have up in those front offices right now have done, have done in the past. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please click like, please subscribe, even better share, and please consider donating to our Patreon.